OK, so today I'm going to talk to you about balancing. But firstly, what is balancing? So balancing is the process of attempting to improve the mass distri distribution of a body that rotates in its bearings without Im imbalanced centrifugal forces. That's the, the technical name. But before we even go any further, we need to consider the safety of trying to do any infield balancing on a rotating machine. So you need to be aware of the sources of danger. Uh, this at the end of the day, we're looking at a big in industrial machine. So can the machine start unexpectedly? Is it possible the weights could fly off? Just consider also the any general dangers of working in an inherently dangerous environment, because maybe you, you or your equipment could become entangled in the machine. You should do a thorough risk assessment before starting or even considering doing balancing on, on this type of equipment. OK, and then. The next stage is we need to consider can the machine actually be balanced? Um, just because a machine gets uh, a high level of vibration, it doesn't necessarily mean it's out of balance. So we need to verify that the actual response of the what's causing the vibration is an imbalance uh, using various different vibration analysis techniques. So do this before trying to balance it, not after. So what we'll start with is an initial checklist. So in order to be able to do a balancing, you need to be able to start and stop the machine. Is it possible to add balance weights? Is there a location where they can be fitted and can they be secured safely? Is it possible to gain access to the machine? And also, is it possible to gain access to the location where the balance weights need to go? These are often very challenging um, things if the machine was not designed to have balance planes on it. Can we control the, the, the speed of the machine? When we do trials on there, we need to run the machine at a consistent and representative speed. So if it's out of the control of us, then we need to consider what we can do to change that. So, and that's all because when we do the actual balance tests, the speed and the amplifiers must be stable during these tests. We can't make an assessment or any correction if the, the uh, response we're seeing is changing or jumping around. OK, so if we've gone through the checklist and we're happy with all those things, we'll now move on to how we actually go about doing balancing. The first thing we're going to talk about is vectors. So. An easy way of considering this, if we just consider a, a ship moving across open water um, under its own power, travelling east. But as well as it travelling east, there's. So while it's travelling east, as well as it travelling in this direction, there's also a strong northerly wind. So if we've got a strong northerly wind and it's doing this, we've got two forces acting on the actual ship itself. So it's fair to say that the, the actual ship will not end up over here. It will actually travel in this direction. So. The combination of these two forces can be combined to show what's referred to as a single vector. Or a single resultant force. In this case, we will refer to it as a vector. When we draw vectors, we can use these to represent the actual force involved, so and we can move them. So we can use this this when we do balancing. So if we have a, two forces, one acting in this direction and one acting in this direction, we can combine the two by adding them nose to tail, like so. And when we do this, we can actually understand the uh, combined effect of these by linking the two. So we can see here. So. Now, when we do balancing, we, we represent the actual imbalance by a single vector showing the force in a particular direction. And what we should be aiming to do is to create an equal and opposite force to counteract this, like so. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at some uh, a simple measurement from a, a real machine, and I'll just illustrate to you how we do the single plane balancing on it. So to start with, let's have a look at the actual data we have. So here we have a, a phase angle increasing against speed, and we have the amplitude. Now, 
often we need to when we're looking at balancing we should be looking at the one x response in this in in this particular plot this is the red response here and for our example we've got an angle of 52 degrees and an amplitude of 60 61 micrometers peak to peak so we're going to transfer this information onto our polar plotting chart so this is our plot now we the first thing we need to do is to understand which what direction the machine is rotating so for a machine that's rotating rotating in account in a clockwise direction when viewed driver to driven now that's very important we should always refer to this terminology of driver to driven and sometimes that means when you looking forward on the machine you should um, take that into account when plotting when we start to mark the angles we should always go against the direction of rotation. So for a clockwise machine, we should be looking at putting the angles in in a counterclockwise direction, just like this. Now, for our example, the actual machine is rotating in a counterclockwise direction. So in this instance, we've got the key phaser located at the top. That's going to be our reference point. And then we're going to add the mark up the angles on the actual uh, plotting paper in a clockwise direction like so so if we have a, a 1x force acting at what do we say 60 microns at 52 degrees we can draw this on our chart as a vector like so and what we'll do we'll mark this vector and label it o for the original so what we're aiming to do to counteract this force, we, we need to um, basically have a, a bal add a balance weight or a correction weight that has an equal and opposite force to reduce this amplitude down to zero. So but how do we do that? So in order to calculate the actual position of this, the weight that we need to add, we first need to do a calibration check. Um, this is sometimes referred to as a calibration run and calibration weight or as a trial weight. Now, even so, we still need to consider when we come to doing the trial weight, how much and whereabouts should we put it? So sometimes it's quite often that the actual standard size of a trial weight is a known by the manufacturer and available from tables or information. If not, then we should aim to generate a force that's equal to 10% of the rotor mass. Now, the reason why I say this is because if you add too big a weight, you add too much force and you could either run the machine from running up because maybe it will trip before it gets to the desired speed um, before it reaches its running condition, or worse still, you may even cause damage to the machine. If you add too little weight, you may not change the response sufficiently to be able to calculate the correction weight. So this is basically how you, if you had no information, this is with this uh, formula here, you'll be able to calculate the actual size of the calibration weight. And where would you put it? Well, if in our in this example here, we see we've got a, a force here. The if the machine is running below its first critical, then we should aim to put it directly opposite the indicated um, imbalance. If it's running above the first critical, remember we've gone through 180 degree phase change, so we should be put, aiming to put the, the weight in line with, in the same location as the indicated vibration level. So in our example, the machine is running below its first critical, so we're going to add our trial weight roughly about approximately um, op opposite where we're seeing this. So we've got 60, 52 degrees there. We're going to put a trial weight just here. And um, just to make the numbers easy, we're going to add a 10 gram trial weight that's been calculated based on the size of the rotor. And then we're going to run the machine um, up again with this trial weight in place and measure the 1x vibration. So when we do that, the machines run up, we then log down the, the result, and this is what we get. 
So we get a, a, a new response now. Basically, we've made it slightly worse. It's different. And we've got uh, 85 microns at 310 degrees. But remember, this is the actual effect of both the original imbalance and the trial weight. What we want to do in order to, to do the correction and understand the sensitivity of the rotor, we need to determine the effect of the trial weight, not the combined. So to do this, what we'll do is we'll draw a, a line between the two, a vector here, and then we can use it as we've done this to scale, we can measure and scale the length of this vector. You can see that I've labeled this one T for trial, that's always the original and original and trial. So what we're going to do is going to measure this length and we're also going to measure this angle. So what we get is uh, 116 microns in that direction. And the, the key thing here, there's two, two elements to this angle. One is the actual 47 degrees, but it's also the actual direction that it moves from. So you can see on the, in this instance, we've changed from the trial weight to the original 47 degrees in a counterclockwise direction. OK, so based on that, we can now calculate the size of the correction weight by taking the ratio of the original amplitude divided by the effect of the, the trial weight and then multi, multiplying that by the actual size of the weight. The, the calibration weight. So in this instance, we've got 61 over 116 multiplied by 10 gives us a correction weight amplitude of 5.2 grams. And where are we going to put it? Well, we're going to start with where we start the trial weight was, but then we're going to move in a counterclockwise direction, 47 degrees further round to give us a location of 193 degrees. So this is our the size and location of our correction weight. And in a nutshell, that's what single plane balance is. However, in the ideal world, we would just be able to put that weight there. In practice, that's not often the case because sometimes there's not actually a balance hole. Maybe you're limited on the number of holes where you can actually fit the balance weights. So in that case, you need to do uh, what's referred to as vector summation or weight splitting to solve the problem. So let's take this one step further now and look at this again. OK, to, to demonstrate vector summation, we'll take our uh, calculated correction weight as shown here. And. We will draw the the um, that represent this as a vector on this paper here. And we'll also add in the actual location of where we can actually put uh, the weights. So in this instance, we've just got a typical flange on a rotating machine with six bolts holding the location bolts. So we can only put weights in these locations. So the first thing we need to do is we need to try and work out how to do this. So we're going to draw a line from the centre through the each of the bolt holes either side of our um, solution like this and we've got the purple and the yellow line here. Now what we're going to do, we're going to shift this line across until it actually corresponds or crosses over where the tip of the vector is and then go back until we find the location where it crosses the other line. So we have this location. And we're going to add a vector there. Now we're going to repeat the exercise, but going the other way. So we'll look at the purple line. And. Transpose it across here again until it uh, corresponds with the, the tip of the vector and see where it crosses over the yellow line. And in this instance, we'll add a vector line here. So we now have two vectors that are equivalent to the original one. And the difference here is these are in line with the holes. So if we measure the amplitude of the, the, the length of these, they will give up and scale them according to the, the weights here. We can actually calculate the actual weights. So in this instance, we've got two grams in hole number three 
and 4.1 grams in hole number four. So that's just a practical, quite an easy and practical illustration of how to do single plane balancing and vector summations. My name's Rick O'Connor and thank you very much for your time.